Okay, so let us continue with our discussion of the inverse function theorem ok. So uh, I want to point out uh, uh, certain uh, technicalities with respect to the inverse function theorem the proof that I gave in the previous lecture. So uh, so let me again uh, uh, give this uh, look at the proof ok. So you have uh, you have certain uh, domain D uh, the complex plane. Uh, well, uh, it need not be bounded. There is some do domain D, the complex plane, which is the Z plane, and you have a function uh, W equal to f of Z defined on this domain. So this D D is an open D is a domain uh, which is an open connected set. And of course, the open set is non-empty. Uh, and you suppose we take a point is that not uh, in the domain uh, such that f dash uh, the derivative of f at z not doesn't vanish. Okay, let z not be a point in the domain with uh, f dash of z not not equal to zero. Okay, then of course uh, if you look at uh, the uh, target complex plane this is a source complex plane with the source source variable is z the target variable is w this is w plane and uh, w is f of z and of course the image of t will be f of d okay by the open mapping theorem uh, uh, f of d will also be uh, an open connected set see the first thing you should understand is if the derivative uh, uh, first of all the derivative is not 0 so it is not uh, uh, it is not uh, it is a non constant analytic function because if it is a constant analytic function the derivative will be identically 0. So it is a non constant analytic function first and uh, the, the, uh, the other important thing is that uh, since this domain is actually connected uh, it cannot be uh, you know constant on some disc okay it cannot just be constant on a on a small disc right because identity theorem will tell you that if it is constant on a small disc then it is constant everywhere right that is because the domain is connected okay therefore this function is a uh, is a non constant analytic function this because of this condition all right and uh, the open mapping theorem says that a non constant analytic function maps open sets to open sets and since d is an open set f of d will also be an open set. So you see this f of d will be uh, an open set in the uh, 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 in the complex plane by uh, so uh, by the open mapping theorem and see the point I want to make is that so, so let me write it here this implies f is non constant so f of d is an open set and you know under uh, under a continuous function the image of a connected set is connected since d is connected f of d is also connected so f of d is also connected and this implies that f of d is also a domain. that is also a domain all right. So f of d uh, uh, I mean I have so d for me is uh, uh, some region with some which may be unbounded it may have pa partial boundary okay and then I will have similarly I will have some f of d it will be some region with boundary here and uh, it may not be fully bounded in all directions okay but it is an open uh, connected set. Okay, and you take uh, let the value uh, let f take the value w not at f of z not. So uh, put w not equal to f of z not. 
okay. Now see what what f dash of z0 is not equal to 0 tells you is that uh, z0 is a 0 of f of z minus w0 uh, of order 1 okay f dash of z0 is non zero implies z0 is a 0 of f of z minus w not of order 1 this is what it means all right because if you have 0 of higher order then all then all derivatives uh, up to uh, uh, up to that uh, 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 all derivatives up to 1 less than that order will vanish okay if it is a 0 of order 1 the first derivative will not vanish but the 0 derivative which is a function which will that will vanish if it is 0 of order 2 then the function will vanish at that point and the first derivative will vanish if it is 0 of order 3 then the function its first derivative and the second derivative will vanish the third derivative will not vanish okay. So all derivatives up to 1 less than the order will vanish okay. So the fact that f dash does not vanish means that z0 is a 0 of order 1 okay this is essentially if you want uh, uh, this follows from uh, looking at the Taylor expansion or by looking at the definition of what is meant by order of 0 okay uh, Taylor expansion of f uh, at a in a disc surrounding uh, in a disc centered at z0 okay. Now uh, the point is that uh, you look at the function so you know you choose uh, uh, now since f is a since f is a non constant analytic function f of z minus w0 is also a non constant analytic function and you know the zeros of a non constant analytic functions are uh, uh, the zeros are isolated okay therefore uh, what does it mean give me a zero then there is a disc i can find a disc okay a closed if you want i can even include the boundary of the disc and make sure that there is no other zero of that function except the point at the center of the disc which is a chosen zero okay so isolation of zeros tells me that i can find a disc uh, of radius rho centered at z0 such that on this disc including the boundary there are no other zeros of f f of z minus w0 except the 0 at the center z0 which is a 0 of order 1 okay so uh, by isolation of zeros by isolation of zeros there exists a uh, rho positive such that z0 is the only 0 of f of z minus w0 in uh, mod z minus z0 less than or equal to rho okay in other words the function f of f of z assumes the value w0 only once in that closed disc and that is at uh, the point z equal to z0 that is the center of the disc and the multiplicity is only one it assumes the value only once because if if it assumes the value twice then the order of the 0 uh, of f of z minus w0 at z0 will become 2 and so on but the order of 0 is 1 the order of the 0 is 1 so it assumes the uh, the only 0 it has uh, is at z equal to z0 and the multiplicity of the 0 is 1 that is what you must understand okay. Now, now what you do is that you look at the function you look at the modulus of this function mod of f of z minus w0 now that modulus on this boundary is non zero and it has a minimum okay and that is what we called as delta all right see uh, uh, let delta be the minimum positive value of mod of uh, f of z minus w0 in uh, on on the boundary disk on the boundary circle okay see if you look at mod mod of f of z minus w0 that vanishes only at one point in the closed disk 
that is at the center okay at no other point it vanishes because if it vanishes at some other point that will become a zero of f of z minus w naught but we have assumed that there is only one zero because of isolation of zeros so in particular on the boundary circle also it will not vanish okay and because it's modulus of a uh, modulus it will be a uh, it's a non negative function okay in fact it's a positive real valued function and it's a continuous function and it's a continuous function uh, you, you when you restrict it to this set this is a compact connected set therefore the image of that continuous function on the real line will be a closed interval okay and uh, the and this delta will be the left end point of that closed interval okay a continuous the Im so i'm just using topological facts uh, that the continuous image of a connected set is connected the continuous image of a compact set is compact a subset of the real line is connected if and only if it is an interval a uh, subset of the real line is compact if and only if it is both closed and bounded and in interval if it is a closed set then it has to be a closed interval okay so well all that gives you that delta is the uh, uh, is the uh, 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 there is there is this value delta that we want and it's positive okay now what you do is uh, uh, now we define uh, uh, the function g of w to be equal to 1 by 2 pi i integral over uh, uh, mod uh, zeta minus z naught is equal to rho uh, uh, zeta f dash of zeta d zeta by f zeta minus w for mod w minus w naught less than delta you def now you define this function okay now so look at what's happening see mod w minus w naught is strictly less than delta is the disc centered at w naught and radius delta in the target plane target complex plane in the diagram i have already the way i have drawn the diagram it shows that the disc is already in the image okay the way i have written it uh, it shows that the disc is already in the image okay but that that is actually the conclusion all right see you define this function first okay you define this function and uh, first of all to uh, to say that this function is well defined you see what is the integrand the integrand of this function is this con is this is this function okay and where is this function considered it is considered on the boundary circle all right mind you i am integrating with respect to zeta and w uh, uh, is not part of the variable of integration so after i integrate it i will get something that depends on w and that is what i am calling as g of w okay now if you look at the integrand okay then you can see the integrand is continuous on this uh, uh, on this boundary circle because you see f uh, f f is analytic therefore f dash is also analytic so f dash is continuous and uh, this is just z f dash z by f of z minus w this is what that integrand is as a function of z where z varies on this boundary circle okay i am only changing the variable of integration from z to zeta for an obvious reason which i which will soon become apparent okay but the fact is that uh, this integrand is continuous mind you this the only problem with the integrand the continuity of the integrand is that the denominator can vanish okay but the denominator cannot vanish because if the denominator vanishes then i will get a value on the boundary circle for which f of uh, is i will get as z if i get a zeta on the boundary circle such that f of zeta is equal to w okay then it will mean that uh, the distance of f of zeta from w naught is less than delta but you know for every point in the boundary circle the distance of f of zeta minus w naught is greater than or equal to delta okay which is a contradiction therefore this the denominator is never going to vanish therefore this is a continuous function it's a continuous function on the boundary therefore i can integrate and if i integrate i will get a function so this function is well defined there is no problem about it okay to integrate a function i all i need is a continuous function on the curve the moment you have continuous function on a smooth curve or piecewise smooth curve okay you can always integrate it 
and it the resulting uh, integral is well defined it is just the Riemann integral all right. So, this integral exists, but it will depend on w because this w is uh, is is uh, is here on the right side ok after you integrate it I will get something that depends on w and that is what I am calling as g of w. So, this g of w is well defined there is no doubt about it all right and mind you g of w is a map uh, defined on this disc and it is taking complex values the fact is that this g of w will actually go back into this disc and it will actually be equal to z where f of uh, z is w. So, the fact is g of w is well defined by the choice of delta uh, of delta ok, but the fact is g is nothing but f inverse the fact is that this g is a formula for f inverse and f in and that uh, g which is equal to f inverse is an analytic function for of w in this disc. So, the picture is that you are you, you are going back so your g is like this so g is equal to f inverse is defined like this ok and see the fact the the point is if you take the inverse image uh, of if you if you take the inverse image of this disc under f ok if you take the inverse image of this disc under f. So, maybe I will be a little careful and say that uh, 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 that this disc I choose also uh, delta small enough so that this disc is inside f of d ok. So, I perhaps it is not required, but let me uh, further further let me write this further let uh, uh, f of the let the image of uh, the disc mod z minus z not uh, uh, strictly less than rho contain uh, the disc mod w minus w not less than delta let me assume this ok. So, I mean w not is in the image all right and I have chosen a delta, but uh, if necessary let me make the disc delta smaller. So, that I am I assure that this whole disc is in f of d ok let me assume that. So, the fact that f the disc is in f of d will tell you that every point in the disc is a value of f. So, there is always a z such that f of z is equal to w all right and the fact is that g what is this g of uh, what is this g of w it is f inverse of w and that is the same as z. So, this this if you compute this you will get z ok where z is the uh, well is the point at which f takes the value w all right and more importantly you will also have that the uh, the function will turn out to be injective on the inverse image of that disc ok ok which is uh, which is the which is the either you take the inverse image of that disc under f or you take the image of that disc under g they are one and the same ok. So, uh, further So, what is happening is further what you will have is f is 1 to 1 on uh, f inverse of that disc ok which is the same as g of that disc and mind you see f inverse is uh, uh, f inverse is analytic if is a f inverse is just g which is analytic. So, it is also an open map. So, the image of this open disc will again be an open disc, but it will be inside this ok. So, what you must understand is uh, that the, 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 the inverse is defined ok and so f will be 1 to 1 on this and uh, f restricted to this disc f inverse of uh, uh, mod w minus w naught less than delta is a holomorphic isomorphism ok. 
okay now the fact there are the, the the technical things that i want you to understand are, are two points okay the first point is that f takes uh, f f is 1 to 1 on that disk uh, on the on the inverse image of the, of this disk and uh, the the reason for f being 1 to 1 is because of this formula okay and in fact you know uh, why f is 1 to 1 on that disk is also because of this uh, this function n of w that we define see you can define the function uh, n of w to be 1 by 2 pi i integral over mod uh, zeta minus z not equal to rho uh, uh, f dash zeta d zeta by f zeta minus w okay if you if you look at this what is this this the, the right side is 1 by 2 pi i integral over mod zeta minus z not equal to rho of d log f of zeta minus w this is what it is this is what the right side is and what is this uh, what does this give you by the argument principle or the residue theorem what this tells you is you will get the number of zeros minus number of poles of f zeta minus w in inside this disk okay but inside this disk this will have no poles because this integrand the integrand is is this guy the integrand is this guy and this the integrand is continuous to denominator does not vanish because of the way we have chosen delta okay so this uh, uh, there be the denominator does not vanish that means this has no poles all right and it will have uh, only one zero and that z uh, see the uh, uh, i mean it, it will have zeros at the points uh, uh, zeta where f of zeta equal to w okay it will have zeros those will be the points z which will be mapped to w and the number of times uh, if you count those points with multiplicity that is the number you are getting here this is the number of times the function f assumes the value w inside that disk okay this is an integer all right but what we checked was that this the where is for what uh, values of uh, w it is defined it is for all those w with mod w minus w not strictly less than delta okay we check that this is actually an analytic function of w he right you know right uh, going back to the uh, proof of the open mapping theorem all right so uh, this is is an analytic function of w of w integer valued hence constant hence it is also equal to n of w not okay you, you have an you have an analytic function which is integer valued and it is defined on a connected set therefore that integer value has to be only one value that means the analytic function is constant therefore it is the same value no matter what value for w i put in particular i can put w equal to w not so n of w is same as n of w not but what does this but what is n of w not n of w not is 1 okay in that disk the number of times f takes the value w not is only 1 it takes the value w not at the center of the disk z not and the multiplicity is 1 because the 0 is of order 1 for f of z minus w not at z equal to z not okay therefore what but so what do you get you get for every w uh, in this disk you get n of w is equal to 1 you get this fact okay now if you go back and uh, if you think about this fact what this tells you it tells you two things it tells you that for every w such that mod w minus w not is less than delta n of w equal to 1 means there is always a z inside this disk such that f of z is equal to w that is the first point and the second point is there is only one z and the uh, uh, the multiplicity with which uh, f assumes the value w at z is 1 because if z if it assumes the value w uh, at z twice then this n of w will become 2 because this n of w is with is 
the number of times the function takes the value w the function uh, f of z term f of z minus w takes the value w I mean takes the value 0 which is the same as number of times the function uh, uh, f of z takes the value w counted with multiplicity okay. So this is 1 so what this tells you if you know if you now recall this this is not necessary this is automatic this is automatic what it tells you is that uh, the you need not you need not assume this. So the originally the diagram that I drew was correct okay this whole disk will automatically be in the image this disk will be in the image in fact the disk will be not in f of not only in f of d this disk will be in the image of this disk itself that is uh, uh, which is what I assumed but it did not be assumed it, it follows from here okay that is one technical point and what th what this will tell you this will tell you that f restricted to the inverse image of that disk is 1 to 1 because what does that tell you it tells you every value w with mod w minus w not less than delta is assumed by f only once in the disk uh, centered at z not radius uh, 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 rho okay excluding the boundary that means that is another way of saying that f restricted to the inverse image of this disk is 1 to 1 okay that is what I have written here okay f is 1 to 1 on the inverse image of that disk okay th that follows from there okay and the, there is another technicality that I want to tell you see if you go back to the proof last time uh, of uh, proving that uh, g of w is an analytic function of w at some point we needed that uh, uh, for w equal to f of z we needed that f dash of z is not 0 okay we needed that the derivative does not vanish at z okay and I am saying now that is also a consequence of this okay see let me recall for your benefit uh, how we got this g of w equal to z how did we get g of w equal to z first of all uh, for any w such that mod w minus w0 is less than delta there is a z such that w equal to f of z that is because of the fact that n of w equal to 1 so there is a certain z take that z okay then f of z that z will be w all right now my claim is that f dash of z is not 0 see if f dash of z is 0 then mean that means you are saying that f the derivative of f minus w is 0 that means the uh, uh, the 0 z of f minus w has order greater than 1 okay see f dash of z uh, uh, for for uh, z in mod z minus z not less than rho and with w equal to f of z has to be non-zero why because if it is 0 if f dash of z is 0 then the derivative of f of uh, the you it will contradict n of w equal to 1 you will get n of w greater than 1 for otherwise which is not correct n of w is strictly equal to 1 what is n of w n of w is the number of times f assumes w and how should you think of it you should think of it as the number of zeros of f f of zeta minus w n of w is number of zeros of f of zeta minus w and z is a zero of f of zeta minus w because z is f of w uh, sorry uh, w is f of z so z is a 0 of f of zeta minus w and it is a 0 of order 1 because if it is 0 of order greater than 1 which is what uh, will happen if the derivative of f of zeta minus w with respect to zeta is 0 which is the same as saying at at uh, which is the same as saying f dash of z is 0 then it will then this n of w will become 2 at least 2 but n of w is 1 so that fact forces that you know uh, f dash is non-zero okay. 
So, what what I want to tell you is that uh, uh, that is you also get that f dash of z is not 0 for all uh, z uh, in f inverse of that disc. So, when you take the inverse image of this disc here you will get some you will get a open uh, neighborhood of z0 okay and the fact is that open neighborhood uh, will be a neighborhood restricted to which f is not only 1 to 1 the derivative of f will also not vanish and it is the non vanishing of derivative there which actually makes this into an analytic function because what what is because uh, how do you get that g of w is actually z that unique z for which f of z equal to w how do you get that you get it by applying residue theorem here see 1 by 1 by 2 pi i integral over uh, mod zeta minus z not equal to rho of this function zeta f dash of zeta uh, by f of zeta minus w d zeta this is actually residue of zeta f dash of zeta by f zeta minus w at uh, z uh, at uh, uh, at z this is the residue why because see the for this function this function has a simple pole at zeta equal to z which lies inside this inside the region bounded by this contour that is the only simple pole. So, the so the fact is that when you take the residue of this function at z okay because this is a residue at a simple pole. So, here uh, uh, this is I am just applying the residue theorem. So, when you take residue of the simple pole this is just limit zeta tends to z of zeta minus z times that function zeta f dash of zeta by f zeta minus w by f zeta minus w but what is w w is f z okay then if I put push this zeta minus z to the denominator I will get limit zeta tends to z f zeta minus f z by zeta minus z which is f dash of z. So, I will get f dash of z in the denominator and the numerator will become z f dash of z and I will have to cancel off this f dash of z in the numerator and denominator and that will give me z this is just by the residue theorem. But to show that so what does it show it shows that g of w is that z is equal to this z. So, in other words it tells you that uh, uh, w is g inverse z but w is f of z so it tells you that g inverse is f okay so this is just residue theorem and to apply this i have to cancel off this f dash of z when i take the limit here and when can i cancel f dash of z i can cancel f dash of z only if f dash of z is non zero the derivative does not vanish and why is that guaranteed that is again guaranteed because of n of w equal to 1 that's what i want you to understand this is the crucial point okay because n of w is 1 f dash of z is not 0 all right for the unique z such that f of z equal to w therefore i can cancel this f dash of z here and and get the fact that g of w is actually z which is f inverse w okay so that's the technical point so now if you put all these things together uh, what you actually get is the following. So, so let me write this as a uh, uh, theorem uh, or let me write this as a corollary that is to you know uh, this is to make you uh, uh, this is to sum up the relationship between when a function is uh, 1 to 1 uh, how that is related to the fact when a function has uh, non zero derivative. So, what are the two situations? So, uh, so the, fir the the first statement is if f is uh, analytic and one to one on a domain, then f uh, inverse is holomorphic or analytic. that is f is a holomorphic isomorphism or analytic isomorphism okay. 
So, you see the first corollary is that a 1 to 1 analytic function is a is an isomorphism a 1 to 1 holomorphic function is a holomorphic isomorphism it is a very very strong statement so corresponding statement for real valued functions is not true a 1 to 1 real valued differentiable function okay, uh, is not a differentiable isomorphism you can find a 1 to 1 real valued differentiable function you can find a 1 to 1 uh, may be even infinitely differentiable function okay, uh, which is 1 to 1 but for which the inverse function is not differentiable for example simply take the function from the real line to the real line given by x going to x cube just going just take the function x going to x cube the inverse function is well defined by the cube root okay which which exists the real cube root all right so it's one to one function and it is infinitely differentiable x cube is just a polynomial so it's infinitely differentiable but if you take the inverse function which is x to the 1 by 3 it's not a differentiable function at the origin okay so, the moral of the story is a 1 to 1 differentiable function of one real variable is not uh, the inverse function uh, it, it need not be differentiable, but that does not happen in functions of one complex variable as you know whatever happens in functions of one complex variable is completely different from what is what happens with functions of one real variable and this is one remarkable thing that happens that any 1 to 1 analytic or holomorphic function is automatically an isomorphism the inverse function also becomes holomorphic it becomes analytic that is a very deep fact okay and uh, uh, how do you how do you prove this statement how do you prove a statement like this I am saying this proof follows from here from our argument see because you see the moment you say f is 1 to 1 okay the moment you say f is 1 to 1 uh, what it means is that if you fix a point z0 in the domain where f is 1 to 1 okay the fact that f is 1 to 1 will tell you n of w0 will be 1 the fact the say saying that the function is 1 to 1 means that uh, if you fix a point z0 in the source domain and you take its value f of w f of z0 as w0 then it tells you that z0 is a 0 of or simple 0 it is a 0 of order 1 of f of z minus w0 so n number of times f assumes the value w0 is 1 but then by this argument the number of times the function assumes the value any nearby values will also be 1 and I told you that this argument actually tells you that the uh, the derivatives cannot vanish because the moment the derivative vanishes then the number of times that uh, the, 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 the function takes a value at that point goes up okay. So, the moral of the story is that if f is 1 to 1 then you are in this situation this n of w is will become 1 and this n of w becoming 1 will force that f dash is non zero so in particular if 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 f is analytic and 1 to 1 on a domain then the then the derivative of f cannot vanish derivative derivative of f cannot vanish and f inverse will be defined f inverse will be uh, defined and it will be holomorphic by this argument and mind you to check a function is holomorphic it is enough to check at every point. So, the same argument that we have here I can go through the same argument I can fix a z0 then I can take this w0 then I will get that f inverse will be holomorphic when I restrict to this disc, but then I can cover the target domain by all by such discs by changing z0 in the source domain. So, I will get that the inverse function f inverse is holomorphic at every point I mean after all holomorphic at one at a point means it has to be holomorphic in a or analytic in a disc surrounding that point and I can cover the whole re whole region. So, I can check that f inverse is holomorphic locally, but that is good enough to check that f inverse is holomorphic because checking holomorphic holomorphicity or analyticity is a local check ok it is like checking continuity if you want to check a function is continuous on a, on a set it is enough to check on an open cover ok. Similarly, if you want to check a function is holomorphic or analytic it is enough to check on an open cover. So, I can take the open cover to be given by such discs ok. So, the moral of the story is if f is analytic and 1 to 1 on a domain then f inverse is analytic and f is an analytic isomorphism uh, in particular in particular uh, f dash is not 0 uh, on the domain 
f dash can never vanish okay so if it is one to one one to one uh, one to one analytic function is a very strong condition it is a terribly strong condition it tells you that it is isomorphism okay and in particular it also tells you that the derivative will never vanish. So, this is the first corollary this what is the second corollary the second corollary is the other condition instead of assuming f is one not one to one suppose I assume derivative of f does not vanish then what do I get okay the answer to that is the second corollary which says in that case you will get a local holomorphism okay. So, let me write that if f is analytic on a domain analytic or holomorphic on a domain and f dash is not equal to 0 on the domain by which I mean that f dash never vanishes the derivative first derivative of f never vanishes on the domain then f is uh, a local isomorphism it is a local home it is not a, uh, a, a, a in particular f is locally 1 to 1 but not necessarily but need not be globally 1 to 1 ok. So, you know so the whole purpose of this uh, this uh, lecture was to try to tell you what is the difference between assuming 1 to 1 uh, on the function f which is analytic and assuming the derivative does not vanish if you assume it is 1 to 1 then it is an isomorphism it is a very strong condition if you assume it is the derivative and if you assume 1 to 1 then the derivative cannot vanish. But if you assume if you do not assume it is 1 to 1 but if you assume the derivative does not vanish then is need not be 1 to 1 it will be it could be many to 1 but the point is locally it will be 1 to 1. So, locally it will be an isomorphism by the first part it will be a local isomorphism ok. So, and uh, uh, what you must understand is that is what it says that is what this argument also says what we have said is that if f dash of z naught does not vanish ok then we have found this disc where f dash uh, we have in the inverse image of this this disc you know that f dash does not vanish and uh, there it is a uh, there it is an isomorphism we have already proved and this happens for every point is it not locally ok globally it need not be an isomorphism and what is the illustration for this the illustration for this is the ma is the if you I will give you a simple illustration for this that will help you to think take the function z going to z cube simply take the function z going to z cube. So, you know here is a source complex plane z cube is f of z f of z which is my w ok. So, this is the z plane which is the complex plane and then here is the target plane which is the complex plane which is the w plane and you know what will happen is uh, 0 will of course go to 0 origin will go to the origin but if you take uh, if you take a point different from the origin then funny things will happen in fact as you as you will know you know I, I take this I take this uh, ray which for which this angle is 2 pi by 3 ok this is the ray on which the uh, and then I take this other ray which is a ima mirror image of this which is which for which the angle is 4 pi by 3 that is uh, 240 degrees this is 120 degrees ok this is uh, 4 pi by 3 and you know these uh, the the cube roots of unity will lie on these 3 the, so 1 will lie here and then this is omega complex cube root of unity and then there will be another the other one is of course as you know omega squared they will lie on this ray and the fact is what this function will do is it will map a whole sector this whole sector of 120 degrees will be mapped onto the whole plane because you know uh, any point here can be written as r e power i theta z equal to r e power i theta if I apply z cube I will get r cube e power i 3 theta. So, as theta varies from 0 to 120 degrees 3 theta will go from 0 to 360. So, this whole sector will be mapped onto the whole disc I mean onto the whole plane similarly this sector from 120 degrees to 240 degrees that will again be mapped once more 
uh, to the uh, to the plane and from 240 degrees to 360 degrees that will again we mapped once more so this so as you go around once if you take the unit circle okay which passes and you go around once from 1 to omega to omega square and come back the unit circle there will go 3 times the unit circle will be traversed 3 times and what is going to happen is you see if you omit the point 0 here then you can omit the point 0 there and the uh, what about the derivative the derivative is what the derivative is uh, 3 z squared the derivative will not vanish if you omit 0 but so the derivative is not 0 but still the function is not 1 to 1 it is 1 to 1 only on this any any single sector if you take there it is 1 to 1 on the whole it is 3 to 1 okay on the whole it is 3 to 1 so what it will what you so what you get is it is many to 1 but if you restrict it to each of the sectors it becomes 1 to 1 so it becomes locally 1 to 1 if you omit the origin but and what is this what is each sector it is the inverse image of the uh, deleted plane the punctured plane so you take the target complex plane remove 0 and take the inverse image then what each of these will be each each sector here with the origin removed there will be 3 inverse images and on restricted to each of this this will be a, a holomorphic isomorphism okay and the, the problem is at the point 0 because the derivative vanishes and at that point there is no neighborhood of that point where the function will be 1 to 1 and that is the reason why the points at which the derivative of an analytic function vanishes they are called critical points because you cannot find any neighborhood uh, where the function will be 1 to 1 it will however small a neighborhood of that point you take the function will become many to 1 okay whereas if the derivative does not vanish you can always find a neighborhood where the function is 1 to 1 and in fact even a holomorphic isomorphism that is what uh, uh, the second corollary says okay. So, this is an illust illustration of both both of these things okay. So, I will stop here.